Welcome to Studio Sense. This is Bob Palmerton. Today, we are heading off to Glacier National Park in Montana, and we'll be on the Trail of the Cedars on the Going to the Sun Road. Wonderful hike, and we will be painting what we call Glacial Rapids. We're going to do a deep blue acrylic underpainting, work on some composition elements, contrast of light and dark, which is really cool in this particular scene. And we want to convey movement in these rapids. So I'm going to start. Here's the reference photo on the left. And, and I will modify that a bit. That rock on the right, lower right side of that reference photo is a bit too large for the composition. So we're going to shrink that down. I'm using acrylic paint, washing it out a bit, sort of like a watercolor in some spots and others are more of an impasto, thicker. Uh, application of the acrylic. The color is, it's a regular deep blue with some alzarin crimson and a little bit of black. So it's a very dark, deep, rich color. What I want to do here is I want to apply the values of this painting. So as you can see in the reference photo on the left, the lightest value is obviously the, uh, the, the river, the rapids, and also the light uh, flashing in from behind the trees, just kind of that dappled light. So, and, and as you can obviously tell, this um, video has been speeded up a bit to uh, to uh, uh, shortcut some of the uh, some of the detail. At this point, uh, we'll slow it down later for other details. So, I want to convey the deepest values with the darkest acrylic. And the mid values uh, by washing it out a bit, as you can see on the river. Uh, across the bank, the bank across from the river and that far right tree, which is picking up more light from the background. That's the rock that I just put down in the lower right or just started to put down the rock. And I'll just go back and forth. And as I visually look at the deepest values, I'll go over some of this acrylic with some darker value. The, the canopy of the trees across the way are a variety of darks, uh, kind of like mid values and light values. And again, the, 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 the parts of the canvas, I'm using UART 400 paper that uh, uh, I don't, where I don't apply the acrylic is gonna represent the lightest value of this particular reference photo. So on that deep blue purple area, I'll be layering on top of that, the greenery of the foliage. That's a, a hard pinkish pastel, it's like a pink gray. And I decided to use that warmer pink, kind of pink orange actually, a pastel color for the backdrop lighting. And then what I'll do, as you'll see shortly, is I'll take a, a isopropyl alcohol and I'll smudge it like this, kind of brush that pink in there with a um, kind of an old kind of a worn paintbrush. You don't want to use a really good paintbrush for this to fill in those uh, light uh, uncovered areas, the areas that have not been covered with the deep blue purple acrylic. My, my point here is to tell me, hey, yeah, that's, that's the warmest area of the reference photo is that sunlight, the dappled sunlight behind the trees. The sun was coming up from the, like the upper left of the reference photo and hitting that water pretty strongly uh, for, for some of the best or the strongest light highlights of the, of the landscape. Time to bring in some real color now and some of the, the pastel colors. So um, I'm bringing in some deep browns and, and deep reddish browns. I'm using unison and um, I think I'm using some new pastels in here also. So I'm generally, what I'll be doing here is generally following the values of the underpainting with the values of the pastel sticks that I, that I, that I choose. And I'm trying to get some really rough strokes in here to um, at least get a base of the pastel. I tend to like to focus working from dark to light 
pastels. And that way, what's nice about that is that helps visualize and, and uh, create really the, the layering that we'll be doing. As we layer on top of the darks, we'll be layering some lighter values and that'll bring out the dimensions of the landscape. One of my favorite pastels is an old pastel, very hard pastel of a deep, deep blue. And, uh, and I tend to reinforce some of those areas with that with that blue we have a lot of motion in the trees the the, the it wasn't windy but there's a lot of um, variation in the in the branches and how they kind of sweep sweep downward toward the river the the, the trail of the cedars you can look it up on on, on the uh, internet is a very popular trail at glacier national park it it the uh, and when you do that trail, I, know, I think it's a five mile or four and change mile round trip. It ends at Avalanche Lake. And if you've seen any of my paintings on my website, there's there are several that uh, reflect the um, the beauty of Avalanche Lake. It's a fantastic glacier lake uh, at the midpoint of the hike. And then you head back through the Trail of the Cedars. I chose this uh, reference photo because of the contrast of light and dark and of the uh, action and the movement of the river. Those, that, that's what really intrigued me about this painting. And the focal point will be a little bit slightly to the right center. You can see right now the lighter spot right above the, the left bank, the tip of the left bank there is gonna be the focal point. That is where the sun was the strongest in this particular scene bringing in some of the deep greens. This is a, a, a unison, very dark green. And you'll find that when you, when you put an underpainting down or work on black paper or a very dark underpainting like I have, you could pick up a dark pastel stick and it will show up pretty light. It's amazing how light it could show up, up on top of that dark surface, as opposed to applying that same dark pastel on a light surface. So it's, it's a way of really building a lot of nice depth in here. You can almost do the whole value range of pastels and green. Uh, of course, you will need certain highlights of the leaves to, um, to be able to reflect that. And, and in fact, we do in the reference photo have lighter leaves that are a lot of ferns and large um, leaf plants that are picking up some of that sunlight that's coming in from the, the upper left. I'll generally work throughout the canvas. So I'll do one area for a bit and then I go to the next area. I'm leaving alone so far that bank on the other side of the river. I'll be hitting that pretty soon. But I want to I kind of want to pick up some of the patterns of the light reflections or, or the light uh, hitting these leaves. So that's why I brought in some lighter value to pick up the, the sunlight from the distance. Okay, here I'm going to start applying some of the darker values to the to the tree canopies across the river, and the uh, the other river bank is really sitting sitting in direct sunlight, so that'll also be uh, a very light source in this painting. Take take broad broad strokes. I, I always like to use the the side of the pastel. Try to refrain from drawing uh, in your paintings. You know, you got to do some drawing, like some of the branches, et cetera, that we'll put in later. But take some broad strokes. Use a lot of free movement in your painting technique. And, and you'll find that your, your results can be more pleasing than any really deliberate drawing of, of, uh, of elements in the landscape. Again, looking at the reference photo, the edges of the leaves closest to the water, facing the water on the other bank, on the opposite bank, we're picking up a fair amount of sunlight. So see where the sun is 
traveling through the trees. And you could build patterns too from those reflections up in the canopy of trees as well as on the ground. Again, the whole point is we want to we want to get the focal point down to that light spot, and we also want to convey some of the action that uh, sits in this particular view. My pastels that I use, I've used a series of different pastels over the years. I've got Grumbackers and new, new pastels and Rembrandts. Rembrandts come in very handy. I like the, the hardness of Rembrandts and the variety of values and hues. Uh, Great American artworks, Unison, one of my favorite, and uh, Mount Vision pastels are, are wonderful. They're larger, they're great value, and there's a wonderful range of, of color there too. You can see I applied a little bit of a value in the river itself. There are some shade areas in that river that you could see in the reference photo. So I, I wanted to make sure that I at least marked those as part of the composition. Again, the, that, that rock has been shrunk down. So I, I think it's probably the appropriate size for this, for this painting. This scene is, there's not a whole lot of distance in this scene. So the colors I'm using are very bold. A lot of what we'll call local color as opposed to the distance where you, you see a lot of blues, you lose a lot of those yellows, you got like faded, hazy type atmospheric effects. You don't have that here. In my mountain scenes and trails that I've painted uh, of the Grand Tetons, you could see some of that uh, that uh, aerial perspective in those particular paintings. But in this case, everything was pretty close nearby, very dark, cool, it was very cool. That water was really cold too, and that gave off a lot of the coolness. Um, so the, uh, the, the shade though was, uh, was particularly uh, intriguing. Kind of bring in some other colors and to work on that uh, other bank, opposite bank of the river. Here I'm using a, a deep red brown, and this is a Rembrandt. Still. And those are great for sharp, strong marks in your painting. Bringing in some, some, again, some of the highlights at this point across the river. This is a truly light area of this particular vista. You're going to have uh, sun catching sticks and, and, and logs on the on the left side and, and sun catching the left edge of the trees and and when you when you do a tree think about the fact that the sunlight coming from behind the tree is going to envelop around the edges of that tree so the edges of the tree will not be really hard and 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 stern and and, and like a straight line if you will or, or very dark you're going to have a little bit of that um light envelop around the edges. So you want to think about that when you when you paint trees. In this particular case on the tree on the left, I've really picked up some true highlights from the sun hitting that edge. And we'll work on that in terms of that that color and help blend that in a bit later on. Little error there, a little brown in the water. So I wanted to brush that out a bit and then uh, rework the um uh, rework the uh, uh highlight of the river at that point. I'm using a, it's a very light blue. It's almost a white pastel. And, uh, and, and that really comes in handy for these highlights. Actually, this was, this was a very light green pastel. I like this, uh, this light blue pastel I use often also for highlights in water, which I'll probably uh, bring, introduce in, in a little while. And trying to get some of the movement in the water at this point. Just dribble in some wave peaks and, and some edges. Notice I continue to use the side of the pastel.
really I'm really digging into the the surface with this. Uh, this is the uh, very light blue, almost white pastel that I mentioned before. I've got similar ones, and these are Mount Vision pastels that are very very light orange and very very light yellow. They, they work perfectly for capturing dappled sunlight. So we'll, we'll want to be careful that we put enough sky holes in here because of the source of light being so strong coming in from behind toward this deep shaded area. Shade can be very blue. And in this particular application, I'm conveying the shaded area of the water. And uh, the, you can almost see that in the reference photo. It's a little bit, little bit exaggerated here, but I, I'd like to get some of this color in here. Now these glacial waters are have a very nice green blue to them. And a collection of unisons that I have that I believe are part of a green set that I pulled apart years ago work really well in picking up some of the color of glacial waters. And there's various like aqua, aqua type colors that um, I use that I find very handy for waters uh, in uh, glacier National work. There are also patterns in the water that you could think about. So we talk about patterns in a painting and these patterns can help guide you to the focal point, guide your eyes through the painting. We could build patterns up in the trees and the canopies, patterns on the foliage in terms of how light reflects on the leaves or it shines on the leaves and how the waves move and how the highlights in the water, the ripples and the peaks of the water and guide your guide your attention. When I do waterfalls or rapids, I like to use rough brush strokes, which really conveys the activity that you see in reality of those streams and rivers and rapids. A lot of snow melt going on. Actually, the going to the Sun Road was closed past the point where you get off to go to the Trail of the Cedars because there was, I believe there was still 20 feet of snow. And this was in late June. And uh, one of the ranger stations was closed down up above. And so we really didn't get to do much more than go this far. Um, you could go to the, on the hike to the Grinnell, see the Grinnell Glacier and all that good stuff. But unfortunately we'll have to plan for that uh, uh, on another trip. Just stay, stay rough with your rapids. Again, this is quite a contrast from calm streams and rivers. You want to handle that differently. But, uh, but I, actually, this is a fun part of doing uh, pastels. I'm taking a bit of charcoal color and uh, now working on blocking in this, this uh, large rock. I want to get the basic composition going. And most of this rock uh, sits in the shade this is a piece of vine charcoal I'm using to help delineate some of the edges of the rock and some of the crevices that are, are, are in this rock. Most of it's in shade, except a portion of the top is catching that sunlight. So we we'll wanna reflect some of that. Actually, the, that portion of the top rock actually had a puddle on it. And so we'll get some of that in here later as a reflection of the light coming in from the left. Most of my pastels are, these are kind of blue gray type pestels to, to reflect the rock. Look when you look at rocks and when they're close to the water, you know that they have that green moldy type look. Got some of that going on. So think about that when you paint rocks near water. And there's actually a fair amount of like pinkish colors in these that I've seen. So deep blues and blue grays and kind of deeper pinks. 
they tend to work pretty well with rocks. Look at the rocks, study rocks, look at how the cracks uh, behave and how how uh, they've got their crevices and little indentations and and uh, think about and uh, perceive how light is captured in those various nuances of, of a rock and that's basically the size of the rock that we'll stick with I tried to crop the photo to get the rock this size or smaller but it was really distorting the photo. So I thought I'd leave the whole thing in there, the photo as it was originally um, captured. When I'd like to, when I look at a, this is a little bit of a lesson in terms of photography, because this is based off obviously of a photograph. When you're photographing a dark shaded area, the lights will get, um, you wouldn't see them. You wouldn't see the the waves in the water as well and the sunlight. They'll just totally washed out. So you want to work several different exposures in a photograph. The photograph that dark area. I just want to see what the what's in the dark area. What are the colors? What are the objects? So I'll open up the aperture of the camera to capture as much as I can a normal a normal exposure of a dark area. And then I'll photograph the water and then I'll photograph up in the canopy of the trees and get the proper exposures there so that I have several versions of the reference photo. And that will help me really see the, the items that are in the shade in particular, but also the colors. And then once, once this photo is on your computer, you can saturate it and see what colors pop out that you might not have seen, you might have forgotten. I try to remember what I'm seeing. I don't take notes, unfortunately, of things that I see when I'm on the trail. So I'll rely on saturating the photo and taking these various exposures to capture uh, what was in fact really there. Continuing to work throughout the painting now, I'll leave the rock, rock for later, get more highlights in the back, There's a, a lighter, kind of like a yellow orange pastel I'm using in these various spots here. Notice the uh, the values in the shade, those small pieces of foliage under the trees, you don't want to get too light of, on those values. If you have a huge value range, it, it will not look quite realistic. We know that those values are, are middle type values, but they look lighter against a dark surface. So you want to be careful if you don't have too much value range in a various area of your painting. Otherwise, it'll, it'll just, it just will not look um, too realistic. The rocks on the other side of the road are, uh, of the river are picking up, and the sticks too, and branches are going to be picking up various portions of light from that, uh, from the sunlight up from the uh, shining from the from the upper left. The hard pastel and a it's sort of like a, a a light one, but it's not as light as the highlights. You can soften the edges of the of the canopy because you're going to have light that's kind of also enveloping those leaves at the edges um, in a somewhat of a muted basis. So what I like to do is I like to soften edges like that. They're kind of in the distance too, so they'll be a little softer anyway visually. And uh, hard pastels and pastel pencils come in really handy to be able to kind of blend and soften some of those edges in the distance. I added a more local color to the tree, a little more of a very deep, very deep brown. Put that actually on both of them. So 
some, sometimes I'm asked, do I use black? And when I use black, I, I use it sparingly. But if I really want to convey a deep shaded area, I'll apply black, but then I'll pick a hue that's a, obviously it's going to be a little bit lighter than the black, right? But it's it's going to be very dark. So I like to apply either a dark purple on top of the black or a dark blue. And, and you have other choices too. In this particular case, I took a very dark, deep um, burnt red, burnt orange color and applied that on top of the dark very dark brown. I didn't actually did not I applied a little bit of black in here, but not not a whole lot. As you know, the underpainting does have a little bit of black in it. In reality, black in nature, where do you see that? You got to wonder where that is, and, and it's either in the charcoal and burnt burnt wood. You would see black, but you really don't see black very often. Maybe some of the deeper rocks and parts of the planet might might show some of that black type color. The left edge of the trees will pick up that light from the upper left. This is a mid-value orange hard pastel. This is a, a Rembrandt pastel that I'm, I'm using. And that'll kind of reflect off down through the trunks of the trees, down to the rooted areas in the dirt. Bringing some of the same color to the other side. It's nice to have balance in color. If you have a, a, a red brown in one spot, it's 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 pleasing to have a red brown in another spot. So balancing out and harmony of the colors is 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 uh, our items to uh, to pay attention to. Uh, these trees, I enjoyed putting these in. So so when when most of the background is done, when I feel that I'm I'm, I'm liking what I see in the on, in the initial background then you start applying more branches and trees and all that stuff and of course these branches are picking up some of the lightest light uh, on the uh, on the reference photo if you see the reference photo you can, you can see those two particular trees when i do trees i try to make straight ones and crooked ones and uh, some of them are lying horizontally or or diagonally on the ground or some of them are bent over so think about the variety of trees in your in your landscape and and feel free to change those too from the reference photo. You know, nobody's going to ask you what. Why didn't you do this on the reference photo? Uh, replicate the reference photo because we're not here really to replicate it. We're here to build a composition and build a pleasing piece of art. So again, more greens. is on more of a mid-value unison green. Also, you'll see more so in the ground, grasses and the ground, you'll see mauve type colors, mauve and, and um, muted kind of pink colors. Remember, grasses have dirt behind them, so the dirt's going to show up in some fashion. So, so when you're doing a lawn or you're doing grasses, um, it's kind of pleasing to have an underpainting of, of and I, I would use pastel and wash that with the isopropyl alcohol of a like a mauveish color or a lighter uh lighter brown uh, or, or a, a more of a maybe a muted red uh, on, on the ground again some of that hazing look that i've done here and the, the with with sun ray, sun rays i didn't i didn't build sun rays in here but you know that the there is a glow in the upper left that we want to convey and with a sharp edge of a warmer hard pastel could simply and simply stumble across, push those, push that pastel across what you've painted, and you you can you can convey that uh, sense of 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 sun, the sun's glow coming through the back of the trees. We have the trees there. So as I said, this was UART paper. This is UART four hundred paper. Pastels are Great American, Rembrandts, New Pastels, Grumbackers, Unisons. Uh, I don't think I've used Centerlayer or if you've ever seen Schminky, Schminkies are very soft. I do use, I do have one Schminky. It's a white pastel and I don't use white too often either unless I want to blend and haze out a distance for uh, related to um, aerial perspective. But I'll use this Schminky that has glitter in it and it's white and it's perfect for like 
um, the caps of waves, wave peaks, um, snow caps in, in paintings. So, uh, so I'll throw a few of those in here and it's almost, it's almost reflective. You know, when you look at the painting, when it's done, it almost, it just kind of jumps out at you, even when it's applied to a very light, light, light blue, even almost white surface that you've already painted. Putting it on top of that is, is sort of like sparkles, I guess, in your, in your painting. So continuing to layer in more leaves that are catching that sunlight. This was, I think about 10 o'clock in the morning and it was a uh, June, late June uh, last year. I would, I would highly recommend taking this hike at Glacier National Park. The uh, the river, the, 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 this, these rapids twist around for, uh, for a good couple of miles. And, and there's all little waterfalls and they rush around rocks and they even rush through uh, a line of trees. And you, you wonder how long those trees are gonna be able to stand with all that water, um, which was just a lot of snow melt coming from one of the upper, upper altitudes of the, uh, of the mountains. You could build some nice detail without being that deliberate with detail by using sharp edged pastels and uh, a variety of values. As you can see across the river, it's not great detail, but there you can tell there are rocks out there, there's the shades the shaded areas uh, to the to the left, uh, I'm sorry, to the right of the rocks. Just going back and forth. So I have a series of national parks pastels on my website, and the uh, if you're available and around in Ann Arbor, the Currytown Concert House is uh, having an, uh, an exhibit of, of my National Parks pastels and pastels done by um, uh, area pastelist Ann Kendall and Linda Klensar. And the reception, uh, artist reception is Thursday, March 23rd at 5.30. Everyone's invited, come on over. There's food, wine, all good stuff. A lot of paintings to view, and a lot of different techniques too that you'll see in this particular exhibit. I tend to do more realism, impressionism to some extent. Uh, I like to kick up the color using the pure color of pastels. Actually, our exhibit is called Pure Color, a, a pastel collective. So, so if you can make it, be a be a great uh, great event. So um, you can see I brought in some foliage again up against the light portion there on the left side, the mid left side of that, that uh, uh, bank. And, and that's nice. You could add some contrast there. I could even darken those, darken those a bit if I wanted to. Remember that I got that lighter pastel because sun is coming down through between those trees and that is also highlighting a little more some of those, so those, those leaves, and that's probably about as light as I'll make those. And that kind of draws your attention down to the river again. So you have a little bit of a, 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 a wave uh, or a little splash in the river at that point too, to get your attention.
the deep blue that I use in the shade there in the water in the lower left area, that comes in really handy um, so that there's not a huge contrast between that and the river bank and the, and the bank, the dirt there, the base of that uh, peninsula, I'll call it. You don't want it to be too contrasty because then it looks like it's 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 just layered on top of it and it doesn't look quite realistic. So you want to soften, either soften the edges there, the, the point of the water where it hits the, the ground, the dirt on the left, or you want to use a deeper value like that deeper blue helps create that impact so that it doesn't look really sharp against it. And you can, you can do some water spray. You can add a few droplets of, of not white, but a, 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 a very light blue, for example, or even a little bit of gray. I try not to use too much gray either in my paintings. And, uh, and that will make it look realistic also. More opportunity to uh, build on that rock. This is a I believe this is a unison pastel, and it's a gray blue, a lighter gray blue, to pick up some some of the highlights on that rock. Someone had uh, one of the well-known artists, and I can't recall who it was, had mentioned that you should start your painting fifty feet away from you, so so you ignore cluttered stuff in the door in the in the foreground, anything that would distract you. So and I, as I thought about planning, as I was planning this painting, I thought that maybe this rock might be distracted. So, so I ultimately, uh, dar I, I, I darkened this rock. Uh, later on, I'll darken it a bit, uh, to re reduce its, um, uh, it's not really distracting, but it's, it's, it's right in front of you. I mean, the, uh, you just saw a, a palette knife that I used the uh, plastic piece, and this is a little more of the vine charcoal, it gets some of the cracks in the rock. But the palette knife comes in handy to blend colors. Bl blending with a palette knife and also using the palette knife to, to firmly build strokes of grasses. Like if you're doing a grassy area, take your palette knife and, and, and swing it up, up, up to so the grasses can actually um, uh, fade upward and, uh, and the tips of them, which are again softer and more faint, would, would turn out that way by the, having the palette knife do that work for you. And I used it to blend some of the uh, rock and the edges of the rock too. That's an orange, pastel yellow orange that I brought down on the left there to again, pick up some of the light enveloping over the edge, the, the left edge of that peninsula. Again, I hope it's appropriate to have this speeded up so you don't see every stroke. Well, you are seeing every stroke, but you don't have to belabor it. And, and I don't have to belabor this. So uh, just to get the main points here, some darker values I add to, add to the upper left. Keep I'm kind of going back and forth and thinking about what I want to convey here. And what we'll do is, what I'll do is, is two, two other exercises that you can do as you're doing a painting. First of all, you can take a grayscale photo of your piece of art and it's, as it's progressed, and then grayscale the digital photo and see how close they are, recognizing that the photo is going to be darker because of the way photography works in the shade. So you got to be careful of that. So you're not going to have an exact replica of that grayscale. Um, you would if you're doing um, if it's a if it's an area that's not deep and shaded, I think you have a pretty accurate grayscale photograph. See, I actually brought in a little more detail. As you work the background and feel good about it, then you could throw in those those twigs and sticks and stuff like that, and other highlighted um, pieces of uh, trees and so on. Uh, so the, uh, what I was going to say, Continuing to work some of the trees and the details at this point. It's a bit of an edge down below. You can actually convey foliage with a non-green color 
Um, in this case, I'm working some of the, the, the soil behind it, bringing a little bit of color there. Continuing to convey some of those patterns. Notice the orange glow, which is sort of like diagonal across that peninsula, kind of wraps up from the upper left, goes diagonally to the upper peninsula, upper to the diagonal through that peninsula. And then it's it's kind of pointing you again toward the river and the highlights uh, in the rapids. There man, it gives a little darkness to that foliage that is contrasting up against the distance, the light distance. No more highlight on the trees and some of the full pieces of foliage. And, it's, uh, and I also softened the right edge of the peninsula, as you can see there, picking up some of that light, enveloping around the edge of the, of the rocks and, and the surface, bringing more detail. Again, really what we're doing is we're really taking, uh, doing su suggestive marks here for the rocks and sticks on the other side of the river rather than building details again with the uh, side of the pastel another note about painting water and rapids like this is um, Again, take rough, bold strokes for the waves. You can start with mid-value blues or greens, then, then the lightest to initially catch highlights from the sun. Um, you could do a study, you could do a NOTAN study um, uh, with a, three different values, black, white, and the mid-value to do water. And, and if you try that, that really forces you to look at the, uh, the river uh, in terms of its basic values. Uh, right here, just to diverge a bit, I'm adding some more foliage. There's a branch coming from the upper left down across those two trees on the peninsula. And, and I'm pulling in some of the, or blocking in uh, some of the, the leaves for that portion of the, uh, of the painting. And that, that is also serving to kind of bring your attention down to the highlighted area of the river, down at the river bend there. Most of the leaves here will be reasonably dark. They're facing us and they're away from the source of light. Getting back to waves and rapids, study, study waves and see how the values are characterized depending on the direction and intensity of the light as well as the rate wave shapes and how they fall over the rocks in the river. Remember, these rivers have boulders, rocks, and um, dips, etc., and those have an impact on how those waves are going to fall uh, across the rapids. This is a blue green and it's a, again, it's a mid value. It, it comes in handy for shaded foliage. You, you kind of lose in the shade, you lose some of that local color of foliage in the dark shade where it could have a bit of a blue cast. So that's why I brought some of that 
pastel. And you might want to think about that. And when you're doing greens, you know, some paintings are have too much green in them, like grasses or, or a lot of leaves. And you, you want to bring in some purples, some blues. And recall, remember that the, the trunks and the, and the branches will have some deep, deep orange, deep browns. Uh, so, so bring that into your, into your foliage. But purples, I like purples and I like blues to be introduced to foliage. So again, we, what we did with the initial um, underpainting is highlighted or marked, marked some of the shaded areas of the river. And I'm using a green gray pastel here, a little bit darker, um, or mid value, let's call it to get some of those shapes into, into the water and to, and to pull out or bring out or help emphasize the highlighted portions of the river. This is my uh, like aquamarine type color. I've got a little bit of green in it, like nice blue in it. Again, as I mentioned before, bringing some of the water onto the ground, like I did in the upper part there at the tip of the peninsula, helps soften that edge, make it a more realistic. Another interesting edge is the edge of the water against the tip of the rock. I wanted to show that as being a nice contrast. And I think I've created that or, con or conveyed that here in the vine charcoal and delineating the edge of the rock a little bit more brings that out even further. Typically, you don't want too hard of a contrast at the edge of the rock because that also will be picking up some of the light over the edge of the rock and you want to soften some of that. There's quite a tangled web of branches in this scene, many of which just emanate from above outside of the canvas. So you won't see where they start, but they do droop down. I want to convey those, I want to bring those in. I don't want to get it to be too cluttered. You can really add a lot of clutter to this if you wanted to, because there really was a lot of clutter. And again, we have the, uh, as artists, we have the opportunity to adjust the composition in such a way so that we can simplify it. Um, sim sim simplicity is good and uh, and keep it from causing our, our view of the painting to head in the wrong direction and, uh, and uh, capture, get stuck in distractions. I think there's a fair amount of nice contrast between the, the branch that I added uh, of the, with those two trees and the light water behind it. Darkening some of the distance to pull out the contrast of those light, thin light trees on the other side of the river. That was a deep blue that I picked up there. Here's my green gray and my um, shaded foliage. So getting back to the palette knife that I used before, it helps blend without removing pastel. I, I also also use I use a tortillon, but often that'll pick up the pastel. So the, the palette knife really, really does a good job blending and it's a nice tool to emphasize horizontal and vertical lines in a painting and to help create them. This is I mentioned before with grasses. You could do the same thing with any horizontal shapes such as a fallen log to take that pastel um, or that palette knife and, and spread the pastel on a sharp line uh, horizontal or vertically some mid value even lighter value greens in the distance uh, to create a little more dimension in that light spot there on the upper left So my Mount Vision pastels are a very light orange, very light yellow, and a very light blue, which is almost white. And I kind of find them to 
to be quite handy in this particular painting. Still building some of those patterns in the water with a very light blue pastel. So when you have water like this and you have rocks under it, every so often you want to you want to point out and convey a tip of a rock, and it'll be typically a like an ochre, darker, lighter brown ochre type color in the water in this particular environment and so you would see those peeking out in some spots in the in the river that dark part there in the center is some dark rock underneath um, and you can see the the waves kind of ripple ripple over that I'm going to build in some grooves and some various shapes of the water, how it falls over the rocks. Picking up that, that sunlight. I'll add a bit of a yellow, bright or bright orange also to the peaks of the water that are closer to the source of the light coming down from the left. I've often been asked about framing pastels. And I've migrated toward plein air frames. Uh, I like them because, first of all, they, they're wide. They're, they're about three inches in width. And that kind of compensates with um, not having a mat. And matting is fine. You know, a lot of paintings work certainly well with mats. Here's the palette knight again, knife again working on some blending. Um, but the challenge with mats is you just got to be careful with the pastel dust. And, um, you know, it's more evident if pastel dust falls on the mats. And it's just more work to frame a painting with a mat. And if it works well with a plein air frame, then I think those are definitely the way to go uh, for these. A lot of the uh, paintings that I do are 9 by 12 and 12 by 16. And I like to keep my framing standardized. So I've really migrated toward plein air frames using a uh, frame text spacer, which is an acrylic or a lucite type, type plastic strip that you adhere to the edges of the glass. Then, um, and so you put the glass in the, in the back of the open back of the frame, then you, then you, and that glass on the edges has this spacer, and then you put the pastel painting on top of it and a board behind it, or, or it could be the mounted pastel, uh, pastel mounted on the board. You put that behind it and seal it up and it's, very easy process, pretty quick to frame a painting that way. And, they, and there's some really good plein air frames uh, that are out there. The edge of the of the peninsula I wanted to build in here. So I've uh, created a lighter value to show some of the sharp rock edges there. And then I'll soften that up a bit in the end. But that has the effect also of keeping your eye on the focal point, as well as the point that's reflecting on the rock, the top of the rock where you have that orange kind of glow. Those kind of corral your vision into that area of the rapids. If you stare at a, a if you stare long at a shaded area with light coming out like it is here, you'll begin to pick up more and more dappled spots of sunlight on the on the surface of the ground, on the on the rocks, on the on the, on the leaves. And you want to you pick those up. This is a blue, dark blue pastel pencil and then some some brine charcoal I used to further refine that the, the rock.
here, I'm darkening the rock just a bit. I want to kind of reduce its emphasis. Uh, not much of a reduction to be done here because it is a rather prominent part of the, certainly the lower right-hand side of the painting. But uh, basically that side of the rock is, is predominantly in shade and we want to convey that. Bring up some of the highlights. So initially we talked about some concepts, uh, the acrylic underpainting, the composition, and it's sort of like an S composition, the line of the water. Here I'm bringing in an orange pastel pencil. That helps with the blending and also to create some of that glow impact that I had mentioned about the edges of the trees where the light envelops around their edges. So I like to use this orange, it's a yellow orange, Pastel pencil and really soften up that um, the distant area where the sunlight is coming from, so, you know, where the source of light is. So we talked about composition and we have like a shape, like an S. It's it's, it's sort of like a backward C actually here. Um, S compositions are cool because it kind of your eyes kind of follow through. So the composition is being kind of corralled, if you will, by the light sources. The, the highlights of the water, the trees, the vertical trees in the distance, the rock below, and the uh, the island, or the peninsula in the middle. And it kind of keeps your vision there. So that's the point on the composition. Again, the acrylic underpainting. Um, the motion in the water is really key. Really rough strokes and using a, um, a variety of shades of blue in this particular example and some greens help build that. The distance, again, in terms of this orange pastel pencil comes in really handy to blend, streak some of those pastels because the, the light is having an impact on, on creating streaks of light, sunlight through the trees. So that pastel pencil is coming handy for that purpose. This pastel pencil is lighter. It's a, it's a, I don't know what, what to call it. It's, it's not white and it's not yellow and it's not orange. It's somewhere in between but it's a very light pastel and that also comes in handy in softening uh, the distance. You'll find that those pastel pencils, those colors are real handy when you're building aerial perspective. So if you're working on a, a mountain range in the distance, you'll want to soften up the edges of that up against the sky. And, and so this technique comes in really handy having a, it, and it could be done with a hard pastel, a light value hard pastel can, and serve the same purpose. So the age old question is when are you done with the painting? You kind of keep working this for, for a while. But um, you, you want to see, well, first of all, does it convey what you would initially want it to convey in a painting? I think that's important. You always have to answer the question, the, the why question of why you chose to do this painting. And why did you compose it this way? Um, but you want to make sure also that it's it's technically correct. And, and by that, I, I just mean that the drawing is accurate, reasonably accurate. It makes sense. Uh, so it shows the skill of, of drawing in, in the painting. Um, and, and, you know, uh, some artists like to kind of fill in all the tubes of the paper, right? Some like to leave blank spots or open spots, depending on even if the painting is toned, you could do that. Or if you had an underpainting that you want to show through, you might have a spot that shows through the pastel. But generally speaking, you want to kind of cover the, cover the pastel surface. Those are sort of like the technical aspects of it. Does it look right, et cetera? Hold up the mirror and look at it in reverse and see if there's anything you would change or adjust. And um, basically it's a personal preference. You think you think you got the basics down and, and it makes sense and you could understand what it is. Think about putting yourself in someone else's shoes. If they looked at your painting, would they see the same stuff that you have seen? What the same expectations? Or would they say, hey, what is this? <laughs> or or uh or I or I, I like this 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 uh, this tree and maybe it really wasn't a tree but part of a part of a building or something like that. It's just 
there, there could be perceptions that you'd be surprised at seeing. And it's great actually to show paintings to other people and to have them comment on them. Getting critique uh, is fantastic. Here's a blue, the blue pencil I'm using now also to kind of blend in some of the, the shaded area. But I'm a member of the Ann Arbor Pastellas and we do a monthly critique, pastel critique, and you bring your painting in and you ask questions and you ask for help on the painting. It's wonderful to get into a critique group because that, that really, really learn a lot that way and get tips of the trade and all that, all that stuff. So this is a very soft shaded area, some, somewhat impressionistic, certainly on the left portion there in the shade. More dark highlights uh, in the background to bring out the emphasis on that side of the of the river. When you're doing a painting, you want to step back, look at it several times, go back to it again, photograph it. I like to photograph my paintings and look at them during the day. And often I'll, I'll put them up on like a paint um, software program and modify them on my computer. And that gives me ideas to make changes, further changes to the painting when I go back and, and work on it. When I do the acrylic underpainting, the acrylic underpainting, it's typically, it maybe takes five to 10 minutes to dry, depending on, again, how thick the acrylic's been added. So that's one, one thing I, I like about the acrylic and also the underpainting of washed alcohol over pastels. It dries pretty quickly and get right back to work. When you're looking at a landscape, you've got verticals and horizontals, and we'd like to have somewhat of a balance between them. You could have a painting that's vertical and have lots of vertical trees, but you want to kind of break it up a little bit with some horizontal trees, some bent trees, crooked trees, a log lying on the ground, to break up some of that, to balance some of the directional movement that you see in a in what might be otherwise a very vertical type of painting of tall trees. In this case, I've got some horizontals in here on the ground across the river and in the border along the river right there, that dark area at the bottom of the rocks and at the base, base of the, uh, the, the ground across the river. Of course, the horizontal peninsula is sort of like breaking up the verticals. Other than that, we've got uh, various directions of leaves and the rock itself has got some vertical and diagonal. So think about the shapes. Think about how you plant the masses of your painting, of your composition on the, on the canvas. This is a red orange, deep red orange pastel pencil. Bringing a little bit more color within the greens. Some more highlights in the river. And you're just about done. I post new paintings on Instagram as soon as they're done, when I'm ready. So um, my address, if you will, is at Bob Palmerton Art. A lot of dappled light going on in this, in this view. A little bit more blue in there, a little more color, color in the river. So you can see the softness at the edge where the peninsula is, the bottom of the peninsula up against the water. Try to make it reasonably soft with some more muted, more, more darker values to, to, so it's not a whole lot of contrast, but you want some contrast showing the movement of the water and the waves and the, and the ridges of the, uh, of the water.
before I had some pretty straight, not straight, but, but um, horizontal strips of water highlights. And I broke that up a bit. Uh, it looked too duplicative. You don't want to kind of duplicate. We find that, actually find that doing that often. Well, we'll put a shrub down, I'll put another shrub down. And gosh, you look at, look at it, it's like a duplicate of the first one you did. We don't really want that variety. Typically, typically we don't in nature. So here I had two strips of the water highlights going horizontally across this river, and I broke that up. Um, so you want to think about placement of objects in your in your painting and look at them and whether or not you've got something duplicated in one spot or another, and uh, do some breakups, breakups and stuff. <clears throat> There were very few sky holes in this painting. There was you couldn't see the sky from where we were, and really the only sky holes between the leaves um, uh, and the, the the canopy was a light coming from behind it, shining in some spots. So, so we don't have any blue sky holes in here, but we have more uh, dappled light sky holes, I guess. This is a Great American Artworks soft pastel, kind of a mid-value green. Using my brown pastel pencils, I'm kind of filling in and, and, and adding a bit of a deeper value to that edge and then softening up a bit on parts of it um, and kind of showing the way it really is shaped at the edge there at the water. And then just a little more blue to finish up the river. All right, I think it's I think it's time to stop. Here's my email address, website in my shop and follow me on Instagram at Bob Palmerton Art. Thanks for visiting.